As you know, the title we choose is from the title of one of the books that Professor Tingales wrote, Saving Capitalism from the Capitalist. And as soon as I sent out the invitation to our 4,000 people in the mailing list, I got one back that said, why should we save capitalism in the first place? <laughs> so I don't want to steal Serena's job because she's a professional, uh, but I think it would be interesting probably also to start with that question. I hope that the person who wrote the email is in the audience because I think he would make for a very interesting uh, counterpart to our panelists. And um, this is also the first of, of, a, of a series that we are discussing and empathizing with uh, Serena Saito, who is a senior financial journalist for Bloomberg News, um, where we would sort of explore different issues in the finance and economics of both Italy and America, and also as they relate to uh, each other. Serena is kind enough also to present our special guest, and without further ado, I would like to uh, leave her the floor, uh, not before having greeted a very, very welcome guest here at the Casa, who is Serena Dandini, who is one of the most uh, important and intelligent TV personalities in Italy. Uh, let me stress, everybody's laughing, I'm intelligent, everybody's laughing, I don't know. <laughs> Because probably it's not that common when you talk about <laughs> So let me stress intent. And uh, I took the occasion to invite Serena to come back. We need to decide the format, but I promise she's going to find a red coach on the stage when yes. she comes back for whatever she decides to do. And without further ado, Serena, Saita, and we just think Thank you. Thank you. doesn't need an introduction but deserves one. He's a finance professor at the University of Chicago Booth Business School, a fellow of the National Bureau of Economic Research of the Center for Economic Policy Research and for the European Governance Institute. He's a prolific columnist and a writer of Saving Capitalism from the Capitalist and the most recent A Capitalist for the People. Luigi, I'm really honored to have the chance to interview you and I'm sure our conversation will be interesting because you are really outspoken and uh, given the times we're living in, everything you can talk about can be really um, fascinating. Uh, um, I promise just not to make you wait, I'll keep Italy as a subject for the end of the conversation and then I'll leave questions to the floor. Um, let's start with your book. A Capitalist for the People, I've read it, of course, and I feel you want to illustrate how the American dream is being threatened by lobbying and cronyism of banks too big to fail and businesses too, influence, too influencing on Congress, and as a result, populism is rising. So what inspired you and what was your goal and do you feel you're achieving it? So, th first of all, thank you for the introduction. I think that uh, my goal is to try to bring back a bit of uh, ideological debate. Uh, it's sort of ironic because for somebody like me who grew up in the 70s in Italy, there was so much ideology and at some point people celebrated that there was no ideology anymore, etc. But ideology has become sort of a, a bad word, but ideology is vision. Where you want to take the country, what are your vision for the future, and I find sort of uh, a complete void of uh, ideology in that sense, uh, both in, uh, in the United States and, and in Italy. And, uh, and I'm worried, this is a part of this book is, is really uh, started, uh, at least in my mind, in 2008, when uh, I realized to an extent I never understood before how much the United States looked like Italy. And not in the good part, the, the wine, the food, uh, just in the bad part. Um, and, uh, and I think that, uh, so I started to go back and say, wait a second, uh, in, in 
1989, when there was the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, Francis Fukuyama said that this is the end of history. Uh, of course, it was a really provocative statement, but if you take it in an uh, Hegelian sense, it was the end of history because uh, in, the, in that philosophical tradition it was a sort of uh, alternance between uh, thesis and antithesis until, sort of, uh, in their view, the so, uh, real socialists prevail. And uh, either of history, what prevailed was what I call real capitalist. And, and for 20 years, more or less, people stopped discussing sort of uh, uh, systems. There were just a uh, different brand of capitalists. Sure, there were like a few French, like La Touche, they were for the uh, decroissance, the, the decrease in growth, but uh, they're not very popular today. And then uh, sort of some people were to say, what flavor of capitalists do you want? You want the, the one from uh, the German version or the British version? But it's like, uh, Fundamentally, there was just one thing, and nobody discussed that anymore. And then, sort of, uh, the financial crisis came, and people all of a sudden realized, wait a minute, we don't like the system we're in. And they started to protest. And uh, in Zuccotti Park, nearby, they sort of uh, camp, and they camp for a long time, and we're still waiting to figure out what they wanted. And so they, they complained against this, against that, uh, what did they complain for? And then you go to sort of uh, Spain, you go to lots of places, and they all are upset. Uh, populism is on the rise, um, but there is not really a, a significant sort of alternative. And, um, and of course, people have tried to find the third way for a long, long time, and they always find sort of some compromise between capitalism and, and socialism, some form or another. And it's a, why don't we try an alternative which is actually, instead of the third way, the first way, but do it right? Uh, and it says, we've always said that, oh, there is sort of I, ideal socialism and real socialism. And every, every time there was a failure of socialism, we say, oh, it's the real socialism, but the ideal socialism is sort of uh, great. So why don't we play the same trick with capitalism and say, wait a minute, maybe sort of this version is we are capitalists and there is a problem in real capitalists and trying to figure out what is the, the authentic one. So that's in a sense is uh, underlying all the story that I tell that also to explain this to Americans because if I went to Spain this terms would not really sell any copy. Uh, but sort of uh, this is sort of the underlying story. Um, can we sort of think what is good about capitalism that we want to keep and what is bad and we want to change? Um, and so the good thing, I think, is competition, which is sort of a, not an obvious thing. Uh, I, I think that people have never fully understood how great Anna Smith was because he's the first human, as far as I know, who saw a good in competition. It's just, in Italy today, competition is still seen as a sin, but uh, historically it was always seen as a sin, since corporations in the Middle Ages sound were created to block competition, because competition was seen as, as something that destroyed uh, profits for the producers and such, as, it was terrible. And Adam Smith was the first one who said, the moment you have a competitive system, then the pursuit of self-interest will lead to an outcome which is good for everybody. And remember, Anna Smith was a, a political, a moral philosopher, so he would never said and never meant to say that uh, the pursuit of uh, self-interest is a good thing by itself. So all this degeneration of greed is good is sort of uh, completely off the, the map uh, with respect to the original thinking of Anna Smith. But I think the idea that sort of a competition can transform is the magic mechanism that transform individuals that pursue their self-interest into an organization that produce great outcomes. And uh, it's only competition that leads sort of capitalism or the free enterprise system to be uh, efficient and, and uh, meritocratic and not corrupt. And I always like to make an example. It's just, it's not a coincidence that nepotism was invented in Rome. Uh, because, uh, and it was invented in the Catholic Church, of course, was because uh, it was a, a, 
alpha means because uh, they were protecting their kids, not their nephews, but popes were not supposed to have kids. Uh, but the why was invented within the Catholic Church is because the Catholic Church is the ultimate monopoly maintained with the use of force. Uh, if you sort of dissent, you are burned in, uh, in the public square. And if you go to uh, Campo di Fiori in Rome, you see still Giordano Bruno's monument. Uh, he was uh, a, a free thinker and uh, he wanted a different version of uh, Catholicism and was burned, and so many others uh, all over the place. And precisely because they have a monopoly position, they could appoint their nephews, children, lovers uh, to all sorts of positions uh, all over the place. Now compare this to the Protestant Church, especially in America. The Protestant Church in America is in a very competitive environment. Uh, you have one church in one corner, another church in the other corner, and if you appoint your sort of a friend uh, in this church uh, and is not well managed, all the customers uh, forgot the, um, <laughs> the, the, the people who attend the church end up going to uh, the, other, uh, the, other church, the other church. The result is that the church disappears. So competition really destroys the opportunities for cronies and for uh, sort of uh, inefficient uh, uh, allocation of talents. And this is a, an important message because a lot of the distortion we see also, also in Italy, and then we're going to come back later in Italy, but about sort of uh, uh, why do we see sort of uh, a famous banker that uh, is forced to divest one of his positions, and who does he appoint? His daughter. Uh, so this is really sort of uh, why is that possible? Why don't we see that in the United States? Because there's a bit more competition. Of course, if you are a very oligopolistic system, you can appoint whoever, and uh, the system will, the company will still work. It's only in a in a in a good competitive environment that you have to pick the right people. So in that sense, that, that that's a good part of capitalism. So what is the bad part? The bad part is sort of uh, when you have some power, mostly market power, but. Market power that comes from technolog technological innovation doesn't last very long. Uh, those of you who have my age or older clearly remember sort of uh, 15 years ago uh, the big antitrust case against uh, Microsoft. And uh, that antitrust case I think was useful in uh, creating opportunities for new firms to, to grow. But at the end of the day, today Microsoft is an old dinosaur and really the important companies, the one with monopoly power, Apple, Google, Facebook and so on and so forth. So the power you achieve uh, through sort of uh, reduced competition uh, but because of technological innovation and so on and so forth doesn't last very long. The power that is very dangerous is the political power by firms. Why? Because uh, we learn from Max Weber that uh, uh, the government of the state is uh, the only uh, um, entity who has the uh, monopoly of the use of legal power. Now, if you are from Sicily, you start to doubt that that's the case, maybe it's a duopoly, a collusive duopoly. But in most places, that's the case. And that power uh, makes the privileges that you achieve as a business uh, through the power of the state very hard to attack. That's sort of a very highly distortive uh, uh, aspect that is not wiped out very easily. That's the real source of chronic capitalism that should be fought. So in an essence, sort of, uh, if you want to be really simplified to the extreme, uh, as an economic system, uh, under perfect competition, capitalism is a great system. All the degeneration comes from the violation of <coughs> the competitive assumption, and we economists have been too cavalier in just assuming that that is the case. Uh, but competition is a fragile institution that needs to be fed, maintained, uh, and, and protected. And the problem is, who has an interest in protecting it? Because Everybody wants sort of uh, to claim a privilege for his own or own business 
uh, nobody wants to fight for the public good. <clears throat> so the, the real problem is that businesses, especially when they become large, they become very politically powerful, and through that political power, they distort the system, they create sort of a monopoly power, corruption, and, and inefficiency, and uh, how can we fix this problem? And, uh, and this problem sort of uh, has been around for a long time. And this is, uh, people uh, initially said, oh, the way to fix it is through regulation. And uh, in the early part of the 20th century, we had plenty of, uh, of regulation was introduced. Over the, this, the, the 20th century, we <coughs> discovered that regulation, to some extent, is part of the problem, not part of the solution. Why? Because at the end of the day, uh, the regulators tend to be captured by the very industry they are supposed to regulate. So if you are a nuclear engineer and you're supposed to look at the safety of the nuclear plants, in one way or another, your constituency is made by the nuclear power industry. And you're not as tough as you should be uh, in, in that respect. So let me ask you, following up on, on the influence of big business, uh, it seems to me that in your book, um, it's very key the difference that you want to mark between pro-market and pro-business. And it seems particularly relevant to me now that we are in the middle of the presidential election campaign here, given that Romney is very pro-business and campaigning against Obama is not pro-business enough. Can you, can you tell me, can you tell us what's the difference between pro-market and pro-business and, and if you, I mean, what do you think of the Romney-Obama campaign? Oh, I think it's very simple. Uh, if you are a businessman, you want a free market when you enter into the industry, the moment you are in, you want to stop that. <laughs> you want to create buy to entry and all those things. Uh, if you're a pro-market, you want a free market both before and after. So clearly, sometimes the two agenda are aligned. Uh, sometimes they're not. Often. Uh, often they're not. And uh, what is unfortunate, and, and this is, I think, part of the drop in ideological tension, used to be the case that sort of uh, Democrats were clearly anti-business and uh, Republicans were pro-business. However, sort of, uh, the fact that the Democrats were anti-business maintained a little bit of decency in what the Republicans were doing because they couldn't sort of, be too much pro-business because they lose their face. And so the competition, also the political dimension, was, was good. Uh, then sort of uh, came uh, the, the deregulation, and I think that uh, at the beginning was, was a good movement. However, uh, I think that business learned to become more sophisticated in lobbying. Uh, most conservatives and libertarians tend to be fairly cavalier with uh, lobbying because they see lobbying as an expression of freedom. And it is an expression of freedom, it's protected by the US Constitution. So, uh, and as far as this is trying to get government off your back, uh, it is an expression of freedom. The problem is that over the years, uh, they became much better at doing much more than that. It's not just getting government off your back, it's get government on your side, in your pocket, working for you. And that is sort of uh, what creates a distortion. And the problem is that there is no real difference between Democrats and Republicans on this side. It, it, it says, this might show a little bit of my sort of political bias, but I think to some extent the Democrats are even worse because they have something they want to sort of uh, overcome. Uh, they have this past of anti-business, so they have to do it with a, a vengeance to show that they are really bad with business. And uh, and so, but it's, it's, a, it's a race to the bottom because uh, you don't see a significant difference between the two. And paradoxically, you see a lot of uh, agreement on the two extreme of the political spectrum. There are more points in common between sort of the Occupy movement and paradoxically the Tea Party than there is between sort of uh, the establishment Democrats and the establishment Republican. Because the Tea Party is fighting against intrusive and overpowerful government. The, the Occupy movement is fighting against uh, the intrusive and too powerful business. And they don't realize that they are fighting against two sides of the same leviathan, the same monster, 
uh, which is the big business in bed with big government. Once you are locked them up, there's no way around it because if you have one and not the other, you can hope to sort of use one against the other. But when you have both in bed together, there is no hope. And that's where I sort of uh, take this very dangerous intellectual challenge and I say, can we use a bit of populace to temper this? And this is really a risky business because, you know, even in the United States, populace is a four-letter word, not literally, but metaphorically. But if you come from Europe, uh, it's sort of a, it's a way to kill any idea. Uh, and you say, you're a populist, and uh, you can say the, the most intelligent things, but if you're labeled like that, you're out. And I say, look, there is a positive aspect of populism, which is trying to make the government account, accountable to people. Uh, after all, this was the principle under which the uh, US Constitution was written. And, and it is what is failing when, when sort of a business is becoming too powerful, it is sort of uh, uh, fa failing on this accountability. And so the, what I'm trying to do in the book is saying, can we use this sort of a uh, huge force, which is populism, uh, which is inevitable at this point. And I wrote it sort of uh, nine months ago, and now it's even more clear than it was nine months ago. But I think that the question is not whether we're going to have populism, but which kind of populism we're going to have. And so I'm trying to say, why can't we use this sort of a range to fight the chronic component of capitalism rather than fighting capitalism altogether? Because capitalism has created a lot of wealth and it keeps creating a lot of wealth. If we kill it in an in extreme form of populism, then we go down the path of Argentina. And that's not good for anybody. Uh, so we need to be clever and use this force to try to temper the most extreme aspect of, of uh, power of business. That's sort of uh, the agenda. So let me take you back to the to the present moment. Tomorrow uh, we'll have the debate, the first debate, and uh, and I think yesterday. I uh, know yes, sorry. Last week you wrote an interesting column for Bloomberg, mm -hmm. arguing that uh, had we had Romney and. Uh, last four years as president, we would be better off. Mm -hmm. uh, I found it very provocative. <laughs> and uh, tell us why. And also tell us what are you looking for in tomorrow's debate. Um, yeah, I like, uh, as you know, this, I like to be provocative. And uh, I thought that the entire sort of uh, contention was wrong on both sides, because the Republicans were accusing the Democrats uh, that uh, were not better off today than we were four years ago, blaming sort of Obama for this. And Obama was saying, no, it's sort of, uh, we are better off. And I think that's besides the point, because uh, every president uh, has to deal with a particular deck of cards that is dealt by sort of destiny. And the one that Obama received was terrible. Yes. Uh, and I think that uh, not recognizing this is really uh, disarmament by, by the Republicans. They should say, look, it was terrible. Uh, however, in a sense, they are making it easy for Obama to reply because they say, look, I was dealt this disaster by Bush and I did okay, so as such as I'm a hero. And the Republicans don't have anything to say against that except, no, it was not a disaster. Or, but the reality, it was a disaster. Uh, he has done okay. He could have done much better. Huh. Um, first of all, recognize that num the number one problem was, actually, the number two problems, number one was jobs. And number two was a overhang of the US economy. There was too much debt all over the place. And the, the first thing you would have done, if you understood this, and this is now a benefit of hindsight because the book, This Time is Different, was coming out at the time, the Obama administration read it, uh, there were some studies from some colleagues, some colleagues of mine pointing out to the excesses. Um, and uh, there were some unknown commentators that were proposing solutions to that. Uh, so one, one solution was uh, to try to fix the mortgage problem. There was like 25% of the US households that uh, owe more uh, in, uh, 
in their mortgage than their house was worth. And uh, many of them were there by mistake. And I felt it was really unfair that you uh, sort of bail out banks, but you don't bail out homeowners. Uh, and, uh, and also you bail out banks in a random way. They weren't even consistent in the way they bailed them out. That, that adds insult to injury. But I think that uh, there was a way, and actually I'm coming from a debate in which uh, there were some people from uh, uh, that period, which I was raising this point, because oh, you cannot, you couldn't do it because it would be unfair, it would increase mobile assets. And, Wait a minute, what about banks? Uh, or because uh, uh, you will reward some people who took too much risk. Say, so, what about banks? It's like sort of there was like a, a, a two set of rules. When when people feel that there are two set of rules, I think it's true there are two set of rules and. Uh, Obama was the ideal candidate to say to sort of turn this around, and he didn't. And instead, he focused all his energies on the healthcare reform. Uh, now, as European, we might say this is sort of uh, great because uh, the healthcare reform, the healthcare here is terrible, and I agree with that. I think we need to reform it. However, uh, by his own admission, was not urgent because he didn't. He decided that everything should start three years from then, so one year from now. So he didn't think that this was urgent, and in spite of that, he basically burned his entire political capital on that. And if you wanted to regulate banks, that was the moment. And he says, you beat somebody when it's down, somebody powerful. But if you wait, you, you don't, don't sort of uh, get it. And that's exactly what they did. So I think that Romney would have done at least as bad on financial regulation but sort of, uh, I don't think it would have done much worse, and at least would have sort of spared some anti-business rhetoric. And it says Obama had to please the crowd with the anti-business rhetoric, making deals on the side with with the, with the very banks he was sort of uh, bashing on the front. Uh, I'm not sure he, he, he did sort of uh, a great result. So tell me, what, what, what are you looking for in tomorrow's debate? <laughs> what, what are the answers? What today we had Paul Ryan on. Bloomberg and he, he, he declined to give details on their tax reform. I think that that's what I would like to see. I would like to see a vision. I would like to see, and this is, I am all for Ryan, he's sort of extremist by many people's standards, but at least in the past he had a, the guts to say uh, we need to touch entitlements. And this is like political, uh, toxic, uh, radioactive material. Because nobody wants to get in touch with entitlement, especially when you know that Florida is a pivotal state, all the old people are in Florida. But you know, in this country, we spend a gigantic amount of money to extend the life of an old person by 15 minutes, and we're not willing to give sort of standard health care to kids. I think this is unacceptable. And nobody has the courage to say that. Nobody has the courage to say uh, this fiscal situation is unsustainable. Now, we don't want to do the multi way just to tax the, the hell out of us to, to, to fix the budget, but that's part of the equation. We cannot arrive there. There is no reasonable path under which we don't increase taxes. And why somebody is not the adult in the room and says that? Uh, and I don't see any side doing that. And so they are debating on sort of uh, what I consider tangential issues. Uh, but they don't want to face the gigantic sort of uh, uh, guerrilla in the room. Elephant. Ele elephant in the room, yeah. Speaking of the elephant in the room, I mean, in this campaign, clearly the, the U.S. economy is, you know, under the spotlight. We talked about it. Uh, the last economic data were mixed. GDP growth was uh, worse than expected, but it's still growing. Uh, jobless claims were better than expected. U.S. stocks are five record high thanks to very loose monetary policy. So, do you think? Uh, I mean, still, I feel that in the debate and the, the political campaign, people talk about that the U.S. as if they're in a recession. And I, I want to he hear why is that? Are we on the verge of the recession? And what is like jobs that you told me is the key part of the economy? So, 
let's compare sort of Europe to the, to the United States. And uh, Europe is not growing. Uh, however, it has a demographic which is different than the United States. Uh, long term, that makes it worse. But a 2% growth in the United States is not enough to keep up with the new labor, the new workforce that is coming to, uh, to the marketplace. So in a sense, from all practical points of view, it is a recession and it is as bad as a zero growth for Europe, at least as far as sort of workers are concerned. Uh, now, if you think about uh, in terms of debt and uh, entitlements, having a 2% growth is fantastic with a V, so a 0% growth, because it, sort of, uh, it makes every future liability look much smaller. So in that sense, uh, uh, the 2% is a huge difference. But in terms of how it is felt by people, it's exactly the same thing. People in Europe are very upset because Europe is not growing, uh, but in, in that sense, the US are not growing too. Now, I think there are two facts that need to be taken into consideration, and I know that's the reason why I don't run for office, because I generally have only bad news to tell people. But, uh, I think that there are two things that need to be considered in the United States. Number one is this is not in an unusually bad sort of recovery, given how we got into trouble. This is historically, and the book by Rogoff is very clear, every time you have a huge financial crisis, a huge debt overhang, the recovery is so slow. And, and that's in a sense is exhibit number one against Obama. He knew that, and he did not tackle the issue. The issue was that he tackled it spending more money. Now, it's more attractive spending more money, gives you more sort of popularity because it's sort of radioactive to renegotiate the debt. You, you have to take some hit in terms of popularity, but that's what the leader is for. In a sense, if we run a, a beauty contest, then sort of uh, uh, Berlusconi is fine, exactly great in beauty contests, not in demo beauty, but in sort of, uh, he, he wins uh, on that ground. So we need somebody that, that leads, and, and this has not been done. The second is a much bigger issue, which is, if you look, since the new millennium, we've not been really growing in the United States very, very, very much. All the growth that we had in the 2000s was fake growth created by the real estate bubble. Um, I think that the good old days where we're growing at 3 or 4% are probably over. Uh, and, uh, the, the only source of growth is, is sort of a productivity growth that here remains decent, in Italy is zero and even negative, and population growth that doesn't make us sort of uh, richer, makes only our liability smaller. Uh, and that is absent in, in Europe and even negative in Italy. So um, I don't think that that's terrible on the global perspective. I think that uh, uh, China and India are growing at fantastic rates and uh, Honestly, they deserve it. I think that, uh, in a sense, uh, in the old days, the, the, the socialist leader were accusing capitalists to leave sort of a developing nation behind. Now, they're accusing that they make them too rich, and <laughs> not at our expenses, but I think that uh, our opportunities to grow are limited by that competition, number one. Number two, uh, it also creates a intrinsic income inequality because it's much easier to compete away in the United States jobs that can be done uh, either here or even remotely by Indians and Chinese than top level jobs. So we are facing an increasing income inequality that is not only driven by sort of uh, the evil spirits or the evil uh, capitalists, it is the result of uh, the phase of development we, we are. But I think it does create a huge problem of consensus for the system. Um, I'd love to go on on this topic, but I feel time, time is running out. Um, so we should talk about Europe. So the markets are bracing for Spain asking rescue funds, but Prime Minister Rajoy said today it's not imminent. Do you think they should ask for these rescue funds and Italy should follow? I actually think that Monte should be first, uh, because for two reasons. Number one, he wants to give the good example. There is an uh, excessive political cost in doing that. Uh, it's a bit like uh, 
in the 30s where devaluing or getting off the gold standard was seen not a macho thing to do. And, uh, and so there was a major recession throughout Europe uh, because all the European governments did not want to seem weak and get off the gold standards. And uh, in that sense, I think that Roosevelt was very smart uh, because he didn't listen to the established economists, listen to sort of uh, some other advice and got off the gold standards and it was much better for, for America. So um, I think this political cost is huge. Uh, Monty is not a politician. Uh, he said he's not going to run for office. So uh, he should give the good example, and this would be extremely useful for Italian industry because this will reduce the cost of, uh, of credit for the Italian industry. I think that my, my nightmare, uh, and I think uh, people have not uh, studied this enough and not made this point enough, my nightmare is that United Europe will end up being like United Italy. Uh, where sort of uh, now we are the South, we collectively are the South. Uh, there are a lot of things, a lot of parallels between the two because you had basically a inflated uh, uh, exchange rate that was imposed from the North to the South. You had a set of rules that were working perfectly well in, in Piedmont, uh, were not working the same way in Sicily and was imposed overnight to Sicily. And, uh, and then the, the last is that in order to maintain sort of order, uh, you had some sort of uh, handovers or subsidies given to the South just to keep them afloat. Uh, but that destroyed, desertified the industry in, in, in the South. And I think we are going through a desertification of the industry in, in Italy as a result of the German competition and uh, the lower cost of capital and their ability to actually buy our business and they often they buy our business to close it. They are competitors. They love to have one less competitor in Europe. Uh, they do it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not a pretty picture. So going back to Monty, uh, you underlined before, you said last week here in New York is not going to run, right? But he also said, I'm available in case of need. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> um, he underlined, on speaking to us, Bloomberg TV, that this was a message for the market. Mm -hmm. But I know you opined on it. Sorry, 24 <laughs> this week on this on this ambiguous uh, message. So, what's what's your opinion? I I know you don't you don't really. No, I, I don't think the the message she sent was ambiguous. I think that uh, people interpreted in a very strategic way. Uh, it's just uh, I think I've not lost my ability to read Italian. And if I read Italian correctly, what he said is that uh, he wants election to bring a uh, leader that has a mandate from uh, the, the Italian people um, and is only available in case this, there is not such a mandate and there is a need for uh, his services. In a sense, uh, um, in a very sort of uh, uh, fantastic spirit of civil servant, I'm not, I'm not sort of uh, here to get any position, but if I am called, uh, I'm not gonna do what is good for the country. And, uh, and I think that he meant to send this signal, look, after 2013, there is a lower bound. If nothing gets done, I, would, I am the lower bound to some extent. And, and that was reassuring for markets. Unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of politicians in Italy who uh, sees that, uh, uh, they're like Turkey, seeing that Thanksgiving is coming. And so they're trying to find uh, a escape route. And, uh, Monty sounds like a good one. He has a credible face, so why not sort of uh, wrap around the Monty face and claim that uh, we are pro Monty? And if you ask them, what does it mean? They, I'm not sure they, they know. And what is the Monty agenda for the second term? He did not give an agenda for the second term because he doesn't want a second term. And uh, I think that uh, it's very dangerous that they try to create this coalition. Uh, just to, I think, preserve their power. And, and I, I, I saw you, uh, you said in, in an interview that Monti is like a temporary problem solver, but he can't bring Italy back to growth. Or... Oh, and, and I'm not saying that Monti himself is not capable of doing that. What I'm saying is that he was called with a very precise mandate, which 
I think was the right mandate for a technical government. I actually was one of the first to ask in, in June of uh, 2011 for a technical government because I thought that was the only way out in that particular emergency. So I think it was, was a great thing to call a person like Monty to do what I call a Bondi-like mission. Bondi is a, a, a manager in Italy that is famous because he is called upon when there is a company on the verge of uh, bankruptcy. And he's extremely good at sort of... Uh, Turn around. Uh, turning around is a big statement. I think more avoiding bankruptcy. Uh, it doesn't turn them around because turning around means you have a vision of how to go in the future. Uh, now, Bondi does not have that vision in general. Uh, Monty might have that vision, but I think that you can only have that vision if you have a mandate from sort of uh, the people at large. And this is one thing you have to do, for example, is uh, get rid of uh, probably 80% of the people that are in the various ministries because they are the one running the country. And so the, the, the ministries are coming and going, uh, but all the sort of uh, real power is in there. And they have their own little uh, clientele, lobbying, and this and that. Uh, now, what I was told is one minister in this government arrived, and the first question he asked his ministers, as uh, sort of employees, was how many employees do we have, and how many square feet do we have? Pretty basic questions. He took a week to give an answer, and at the end said, what intentions do you have? <laughs> because they, they know these guys pass, and they rest, they stay. So they don't want to change. The only way to change is that I'm here. I have a mandate from the Italian people, and I'm here for the next five years. So either you get in line, or you get out of the door. Uh, and I think that would be refreshing. And uh, you know, there's an, this is not only in the public administration. There is an entire sort of uh, uh, underlying of uh, businessman. Or I was trying to find the translation in English for a. Um, uh, affa no, uh, not affa Faccendiere. Faccendiere. Is Willer and Dina. I think it's Willer and Dina, but there's not really a good translation. But in Rome, Faccendiere, it's a job. What about, and what about the rainmaker? <laughs> no, the rainmaker is somebody that brings you business. It's a very different thing. Faccendiere is somebody you go to if you want to be appointed at uh, the Bank of Italy, for example. You go to a Faccendiere and you ask. And of course, he wants something in exchange. And there's an entire sort of a uh, uh, zoo of people like this. <laughs> and uh, I think that until you eliminate this, you cannot change Italy. And to eliminate that, you have to have a government that says, you know what? You, you go home because I won the election and we turn page. So um, do you think this crisis is an opportunity for Italy? Turn page and eliminate all these people, and, and uh, tell me also about your relationship with Matteo Renzi. I think So, I think it's a huge opportunity. I think it's the, the best opportunity we had in at least 20 years. Uh, I think that a crisis always comes with an opportunity, and that's what uh, we need to take advantage of. We, there is the pain of the crisis that we should not forget, but there is also the opportunity. So, I think, I think it is a, a, a big opportunity. Uh, I think it would be a crime to miss this opportunity. I think that 20 years ago we had a similar opportunity, we miss it, and uh, look where we are now. So I don't think we can afford to miss this opportunity. And uh, in terms of Matteo Renzi, uh, I sort of uh, like him. I think that in the uh, scheme of people with political experience... Let's he, explain who he is for uh, Matteo Renzi is, is the mayor of Florence and is now running for um, the primaries in the Democratic Party. And uh, one of the, the things he's famous for is that he said he wants to sort of uh, um, send home all the people uh, that have at least two um, mandates in, in Congress. So it's kind of a, a term limitation uh, that uh, we can discuss whether in the long term is a good or a bad thing. But at this point, I think it's necessary to change this. Because if we don't, I don't think it's sufficient uh, if you change people and you don't change the incentives, you don't go anywhere. But if you change the, you try to change the incentives and you keep the same people, you don't go anywhere either. So I think that uh, uh, he seems to uh, be able to talk to 
uh, people in general, which I think is crucial for a politician. Um, and uh, he seems to have the right ideas. Now, he is a member of a party that I don't particularly like, at least historically, uh, but uh, he is promising to sort of uh, clean it up. And uh, we heard on TV that uh, the other side is helping him. And so, as Diana said, that uh, if Renzi is uh, 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 winning the primary, he's going to leave the Democratic Party. And I think more people are going to go and vote for Renzi. <laughs> and so, okay, let's say he, get, he gets elected. He proposes to be uh, his minister. Uh, first of all, I have to ask my wife, uh, which is uh, a big, uh, a big if. I think that, uh, as I said many times, I I don't care about having a position if that does not really uh, give an opportunity to change the country. If there is a real opportunity to change the country, I think it's a moral duty for everybody who has something to contribute to contribute in whatever position you can contribute. So. I think that uh, I, I will try to do my best uh, in the extent I can. So I think it's about time for, for the audience to, to have a chance to ask questions. You just raise your hand. Well, Introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, I work for It's All Against the Welfare Way. Uh, Besides the fact that I don't really agree with your assumption about the Democrats being anti-business and the Republican being pro-business, I think the real issue for the last 100 years in this country has been redistribution. Uh, in the teens, early 20s, uh, the wealth of the country was moving toward the only, you know, basically transforming the country in oligarchy. From the 30s till the 70s, with mostly Democrats in control, there was a redistribution that created the largest uh, middle class in this country. After the oil shocks has been a crisis, and since then, basically, it's been a redistribution the other way around. Uh, now, Romney is talking about redistribution, accusing Obama of wanting to do redistribution. And Obama is basically saying that the Republicans have been doing it for the last 30 years. How do you feel about that? I think that. Uh, uh, the distribution is the side of populism I'm afraid of, and I think that will have a, a big backlash. I, I disagree that the middle class was created by the redistribution imposed by the Democrats. I think that uh, the middle class was a, a nice outcome of a monopoly position that the United States had in, in the world at large. In a sense, think about you finish World War II, you are the only country that has its industrial power untouched by the war, in fact, has become more efficient as a result of the war. Uh, you are the only country uh, with, maybe with the UK, with a decent rule of law. Uh, you are the only country with a workforce that is relatively highly educated, because as a result of uh, the progressive era legislation in the 10s and 20s, uh, high school diplomas were sort of uh, fairly common in, uh, in the United States. I think 30 or 40 percent of the population had a high school diploma in, in 1948. When you go to Italy, not to mention sort of other countries, and there were like a large fraction of the population was still illiterate. So if you are in that situation, you have a huge technological advantage, and basically you can't invest in other countries because you cannot trust the institutions you cannot trust the political system, and you don't have an educated workforce. You have to invest in the United States. And basically, the Joe the plumber with a high school degree in the United States was a scarce factor. And as all scarce factor, earn a rent. And that rent allows sort of uh, the American dream to come true. And uh, unfortunately, that situation has disappeared because now Joe the plumber is competing, maybe not in the plumbing business yet, and says the plumbing business is competing with all the Mexicans that are coming, legally or illegally, but in every other profession, including an increasing number of uh, more sophisticated professions, is competing with the rest of the world. So even sort of uh, low level lawyers and accountants now can be sort of outsourced uh, with the internet in India or in China. And uh, that competition reduces dramatically 
the, the rent that American workers are getting. So uh, I think there is an issue. Uh, are you going to fix this problem? Are you going to try to fix it by redistributing? Uh, or are you going to try to fix it by giving a better opportunities to, to people? Uh, because uh, I think that uh, increasingly the middle class and lower class see that they don't have a chance to the American dream. They start uh, handicap in a game that is, is becoming more and more competitive, uh, in a game that is more and more the winner take it all, and, uh, and they kind of lose hope. So my sort of route is uh, to try to give them opportunities, not to ensure them an outcome through a massive distribution. Uh, but honestly, I don't see even the, the majority of the Democratic Party today asking for a massive distribution. Um, I think it's, it's sort of a, even uh, the one that they propose is, is not that big. Now, the Socialist Party in France is more in that direction, and we see how it will survive. Um, I think that uh, uh, many people think that uh, France is the new South in terms of Europe. Uh, I think that uh, after we fix uh, Spain and Italy with asking the bailout, France is next. And Holland is sort of contributing to speeding up the process. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one is the link to what you were just saying. Uh, you were talking about opportunities and uh, competition, and also at the beginning you were talking about uh, competition and so on. Uh, but uh, how do you? Uh, which is the way to create these opportunities? Mm -hmm. First question. I mean, uh, first point about, about this, and and second thing is that don't you believe that this? Uh, I mean, the this you know stressing more and more on competition is actually uh, can actually bring things uh, to a, a worse world uh, instead of a better world and so yet also uh, the Romney versus Obama you know uh, uh, it's like also two different kind of different ideas of world and not only uh, from an economic perspective but also from a cultural and social perspective like isn't I don't you believe that Obama is trying to uh, promote, uh, which is of course is really different. It takes time, uh, a different, a different idea of different uh, world, especially here in the U.S., which has always been 100% uh, driven towards uh, competitive, competitiveness, which is of course a great, great thing, but in some ways also can also be, you know, a, a scary, a scary thing. Uh. I think both questions are, are, are very important. Uh, first of all, I agree with the scale component. So I do believe that the way in which you maintain a system competitive is by ensuring uh, the losers. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. So uh, adding a, a, a decent welfare system that is sort of an individual welfare, not corporate welfare, uh, is crucial to maintain the system working. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I, I don't know whether sort of uh, Romney pays just lip service to it or so believes in it, but I definitely believe that's an essential component. But giving opportunities more, I think that people are, are falling behind in the United States because uh, primary education is terrible. And uh, I think that uh, there are two reasons why uh, it's terrible and, and it can be fixed. One is uh, uh, is probably the only sector where we don't apply any quality standard. Uh, and it's becoming a growing sector in the economy, but there's no way in which we reward more people that do better and uh, we penalize people who do worse. And uh, uh, even sort of Ron Emanuel in Chicago is fighting like the unions to try to establish uh, merit pay, uh, which is tricky because uh, I discussed this in my book, uh, meritocracy relies on the existence on an objective way to measure merit, which of course doesn't exist. So I think it's a bit of a circular argument. But I think that in terms of uh, uh, teacher performance, it is possible to measure teacher performance quite accurately and separate uh, what is the input from uh, what is the endowment. And so if you teach people uh, in Manhattan, it's easier to have better results than if you teach them in the Bronx, uh, just from a starting point of view. However, you can easily, uh, with modern econometric techniques, take care of that and, and have merit paying 
which is uh, accurate. And, and the same is uh, sort of, uh, you can take even sort of, uh, if you want, right-wing ideas like uh, the school voucher and turn them into an opportunity. So in my book, what I argue is that why don't we make vouchers uh, with a different value depending on your starting point. So if you are, if your parents don't have a high school degree, uh, then uh, your voucher is worth more than if you are born in a family where both uh, uh, parents went to college or something like that. I think that that, that is a way to create uh, incentives for schools to actually go and find talents and, and nurture talents in, in, early, in early period. I think that that's, that's a crucial element. Um, but I don't think that, at least in my view, there is not such a dramatic vision difference between Obama and, and Romney. Obama is not Hollande. Hollande is a clear sort of a very stated vision that he believes in government spending uh, and he believes in sort of uh, taxing 75% of the rich people, etc. Obama is nowhere close to that. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, more nuances, but I don't see a huge ideological divide between, between the two. Um, I have a couple of questions. They are partly related to the question I have to ask you. Especially mature economies, so uh, Western Europe and states, North America, how do you see the relationship between job creation and, and competition? Uh, to goods, but if you were to, if they become a trade off, do you think at some point you? have a preference for one against the other. It's, I think it's part of the sense of, of, of this first question. And the second question is how, again, in mature economies in both in North America and, and in Western uh, European countries, how do you see us coming out of the debt hole, government debt hole that we put ourselves? Okay, so I think in the short term, you might see a trade-off between sort of competition and job creation in the long term. Uh, you don't. So, uh, look at Italy as a, as a fantastic example of what can go wrong. Because uh, take take news agents. Okay, in Italy they were protected because you cannot until very recently you could only sell newspapers in uh, news news agents, dedicated news agents. So, if you think about a way to create employment, that's one. Um, what is the result? Now the iPad and the Kindle and all those things is becoming popular and uh, that job is disappearing anyway. But in the meantime, what you've done is that you have induced young people to give up other opportunities and enter that profession. A, a friend of mine in high school uh, gave up going to college because, because his father owned a news agent in a central location in Padua and was basically printing money, saying, why should I study? I go and work there. Now uh, he's turning 50 and he's without a job. Uh, so the problem is that if you try to protect jobs out of sort of what is reasonable, what you end up doing is just delay the adjustment, which might be good and bad because you say you soften up the blow for some people, but also inducing people to specialize in that sector. When I was in Italy, I was in a uh, TV show with some uh, miners from uh, Sardinia. And they were saying, you know, in Sardinia, they kept a mine alive for 15 years with subsidies. And now the subsidies are ending and uh, there is no way to go. Now, not only they kept those workers there, but new workers, young people, started to become miners. So it is a factor of new unemployment in the future. If you could have a system in which you say, oh, we keep this alive for the old people, like uh, a geriatric center, but we prohibit young people to enter here, that would be kind of a, a, at least a reasonable trade-off. Unfortunately, you don't have that opportunity. So that, that is the sense in which in the long term, the trade-off doesn't exist. And, and that's the sense in which I say you have to have a safety net, because uh, if you don't, 
uh, it says closing the mines in, in uh, Sardinia is a social disaster. It's one of the few jobs available there and uh, if you sort of uh, don't uh, uh, find them an alternative, uh, at least a temporary alternative, uh, it is, uh, is a social disaster. However, what I find uh, distasteful is that the companies use these workers to try to get subsidies. They, they ship them to Rome to complain in sort of a in public manifestation in Rome so that they get subsidies themselves. I think we should give individual welfare, but not corporate welfare. Corporate welfare is distasteful and sort of uh, damaging the real essence of, of the economy. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the Grand Canyon here, you have a big sign that says, don't give food to animals. And they explain that you shouldn't give them because the, the wild animals become not wild if you keep them giving them food. And they lose the ability to survive in the, in the natural environment without the, the, the food from the tourists. That's my model for sort of Washington or Rome. Don't give sort of subsidies to companies because you make them unable to compete long term in the marketplace. And uh, take, a, take the example of Fiat. Fiat was protected from competition, from the Japanese competition for many, many years. What is the result? That Fiat was on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, I think that giving sort of uh, these uh, things are perceived as act of kindness, de facto, is actually a cruel thing because you make some people dependent and you prevent some young people to have a new career. So that's the easy part of the answer. The difficult part of the answer is what do you do with, with Europe and the debt? I think that uh, it is a, a real problem moving forward. Uh, it's not just the debt, but all the entitlements. I think that we live sort of uh, above our means for a long time pushing all the costs to the future. And it was a reasonable strategy because if you have a growing economy and a growing population, pushing to the future is, is sort of reasonable. Uh, when Keynes was talking in the 1930s, that GDP was 20%. The economy, at least potentially, was going fast and the population was going. So what he was saying was perfectly reasonable in the 1930s. Uh, today is not reasonable. So how do you get out? I think we need to start renegotiating some claims. And uh, one way is to say, you know, people who have uh, received pensions without any contribution, we need to think about whether this is an entitlement that cannot be touched. And another thing is, is uh, why don't we have uh, increase in future pensions or in future sort of entitlement as a uh, function of growth in GDP? So that if uh, in real GDP, so if the country is growing, everybody's benefit. If the country is not growing, we don't want to have a category of rentier, uh, old rentier, that live off uh, the young people. Because in Italy today, young people have no future. Uh, the reason why you see so many of them here is because honestly, they are there no future. Uh, not only have no future, when they enter the job market, if they find a job. They are saddled with the liabilities of their parents. They, they earn basically close to nothing. And in addition to this, they have to save like crazy because with all these reforms, pension reforms, we always screw the future generation, not the current one. So the, the new people that enter the labor force now in Italy, they will not have a decent pension when they retire. And that's a pretty sad thing to, to think about. Christian, let me tell you, he's an economist and works with Nuria Rubini. All right, so I don't have to introduce myself. <laughs> um, well, you know, about the last remark on the pensions, I guess that, uh, you know, it's probably even worse here, right? Uh, but anyway, besides... It's worse here except that you have population growth. Uh, and, uh, and, and so far, also some growth in productivity. And those can do miracles if you compound them. Uh, in Italy, if you look at the, the past, we had zero productivity growth for the last 10 years. And you look at the future, unless we have a massive import of immigrants, which creates social unrest, uh, we're not going to keep up uh, and GDP will go down. So 
But I had an additional question for you. I wanted you to, you know, put back your uh, professor of finance hat mm -hmm. uh, and you know, move away for a moment from the politics of it. And I wanted to go back for a second to what you said uh, earlier about 2008 and, mm -hmm. and the financial crisis that we just went through. And uh, you know, it's true, right? We bailed out the banks, we bailed out some corporations, so we used that, we used taxpayers' money to do that, right? And we didn't uh, structure mortgages, so people that were in negative equity back then most likely still are today because home prices are not rising, right? And that's an issue that, uh, that of course, uh, hinders the deleveraging process of the private sector and going back to Europe. That's, that's all true, right? But so going back uh, you know, to, to 2008, uh, uh, I think that the choice of bailing out uh, a large chunk of the financial sector uh, was mostly related to the fact that we, you know, we decided to try to play the card of avoiding moral hazard and let Lehman fail. And we learned that that was a disaster, right? So this time is not different from others, but this financial crisis was something that we had not experienced in a long, long time, right? And perhaps our memory is too short to, to go back to that long, long time, right? So when Lehman failed, of course, uh, credit markets froze across the globe, right? Mm -hmm. And then we decided that uh, after having experienced that, perhaps it was a good idea to go back to what we did March of that year, which was, you know, letting JP Morgan, or financing JP Morgan as a condition of first term. We did the same between uh, uh, what Fargo and Wachovia. We did the same between JP Morgan and Washington Mutual. We did the same again with uh, uh, was of Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, right? And, and what about AIG? And AIG. That was the, that was the biggest of them all, right? That and was and the that was effectively a bailout of gold, right? So, so my question is the following, right? So first of all, what are your thoughts about uh, you know, bailing out the banks, right? We still have this too big to fail problem. And of course, you know, we live in a world which is driven by credit and leverage, right? So mm -hmm. that's the recipe for growth, right? And we stop that, we stop growth, right? And your population and productivity go up alone, not And uh, And the second part of the question is that, you know, and perhaps I'm stepping back into the political territory, we are, you know, we are going towards some change of this that, that, uh, from a political perspective, the administration is changing. Do you think that, that the too big to fail problem that today is bigger than, than before, right? Because we have larger banks given all this merging, right? Is, uh, is still an issue, it's gonna be tackled, it's gonna change, uh, you know? Where is the competition there? Talking about big businesses being in, being in bad with governments, right? So what are your thoughts about all this? I think that, uh, first of all, uh, I don't want to uh, discuss uh, all the details of the 2008 financial crisis because otherwise we we'll, we'll end up tomorrow. Uh, but it is clear, and I think you agree with that, I think you agree with that, is that uh, the response of the government was completely inconsistent in its behavior, which contributed to, to the crisis itself. And again, I think it's an example of a, of a lack of a vision. Paulson uh, was a investment banker used to do deals, so he had no understanding of uh, general equilibrium and no understanding of uh, sort of an overall strategy, was pushing a deal over another. And there is a beautiful scene in the To Be To Fail uh, uh, book where they gather to discuss uh, how they're going to deal with uh, uh, Lehman, and one guy raised their hands and said, what about AIG? And uh, Paulson said, oh, that's tomorrow's problem. Uh, and he didn't understand it was exactly the day after problem, but uh, this suggests that it was completely a lack of vision, etc. Um, now, what, I, what makes me angry about this is that uh, in the discussion and the common sort of view, etc., it is presented as we had a choice between the Armageddon and uh, bailing out the banks. We chose to bail out the banks is the less evil. And I think it's false. And this is, I think there was a chance of the Armageddon, I absolutely agree with. Uh, could we at least try alternatives? And the answer is yes. And uh, well, the simple alternative. Uh, the banks did have enough debt, long-term debt, to absorb all the losses. So had you done a sort of special bankruptcy sort of uh, holiday or provision, that allow them to do a debt for equity swap, you could have absorbed all the losses. And there would be some losers, sort of uh, some investors. But I think that having a free market system without bankruptcy is like having religion without sin. It doesn't work. And, uh, and so I think that fixing the, the too big to fail is really essential uh, for restoring uh, 
the working of uh, the free market system. And uh, do I expect anybody to uh, do it anytime soon? No. Uh, one reason why I like Paul Ryan is because he endorsed my plan to fix it. Uh, actually, my plan with Oliver Hart, which uh, I can give you the details if you're interested. But I think it is at least a coherent approach to do it without uh, going to 100% equity like uh, uh, Anna Matti and company are advocating. So I think if you work hard, you can find a solution. Uh, you must have a political will. The problem is that this political will doesn't exist. And, and that's, I think, is, is the problem. So coming back to my book, I think that's where I see sort of a, a kind of a, a challenge and an opportunity because all the rage of people complaining about the too big to fail, about, it, about two set of rules and etc., was not unjustified. And maybe the way they complain is unsophisticated, but at the end of the day, there is an element of truth in what they are saying. And I think it's incumbent upon us, more sort of uh, educated people, to try to uh, give them mechanisms that they can understand, give them so sort of, uh, they can trust and that it work so that uh, their desires are satisfied. And I think that that is not only a way to pacify this revolt, it's also a way to make our system better. Uh, we have another question, I would say it's the last. Yes, uh, I'm uh, Massimo Tomazzoli. Uh, I have a question on one aspect that you briefly uh, touched upon uh, twice in your uh, presentation, which is the role of uh, emerging powers like uh, India and China. We focus a lot on uh, you and the US and Europe. Uh, and namely, I'm interested in uh, uh, your opinion on whether there is a different uh, script, let's say, on uh, uh, capitalist development when you uh, look at the way uh, China is growing. Uh, namely, you refer to uh, the uh, huge problem of consensus, which is related to increasing income inequality. But the, the problem of consensus is a problem uh, very different in a, in a democratic uh, system and in a system which is not democratic. So how, how do you see that? So I tell you a, a little secret. It's very easy to catch up. It's much more difficult to lead. So uh, in, in practical terms, uh, Many countries, when they are moving from an agricultural society to first industrialization, uh, they get it right and uh, they have a huge bonanza. Uh, and you don't need the most sophisticated institutions, democracy, etc., etc., to get it right. Uh, in a sense, in Italy, it worked under a very uh, sort of sketchy uh, democracy after World War II. Uh, we have seen Korea doing with a fairly dictatorial regime. We saw Japan do it after World War II with kind of a half-baked democracy. And we've seen China do it with a complete dictatorship. Um, I think is is feasible and is not that difficult. What is much more difficult is what you do next. Uh, when I teach my PhD students, I say it's you need to change regime here because the reason why you arrived here is because you were very good at studying, studying what other people have, have produced. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But from now on, you're not supposed to study other people, you're supposed to innovate. And that requires a completely different set of talents. Some, of course, might be the same, but some not. And there is an intrinsic uncertainty about where to go. Because if I knew exactly what is the right thing to, to, to where to go. I would go myself and it would be easy for you to follow. But uh, it, it, it's not. And, and we faculty debate all the time on, on different directions. And that's what I think capitalist economists are good at in finding the new, new thing. Uh, I, as a sign of um, humility, when in 1999 some students started to, to come to my office and talk about uh, relational software and social network, my reaction was, how do you make money out of it? And uh, uh, of 
course, I should have known. But I'm but, saying. Well, they still have to prove it. That, that maybe. <laughs> but, but the point is that if I that was probably the best trained to see this, I fail. Imagine it, sort of a, a, what a sort of a big government bureaucracy can do. Uh, so my forecast is that uh, the future of China is not as uh, happy and uh, uh, sort of uh, as people make, and I don't think they represent a new form of uh, uh, development. Uh, they are representing, I think, a new form of chronic capitalism. And it's just that uh, because there is lack of transparency, you don't see that much. But uh, the trial of, uh, I can't pronounce the name of, uh, but you know who I talk about. The, yeah, uh, suggests that uh, there are huge corruption problems. And if, it was a, if there was a bit more transparency and people knew how much money this guy is sort of uh, uh, broad abroad, there will be social unrest as well. So I, I actually, it says, I wish the situation there was easier because it would make sort of uh, easier for all of us because it would be a, a sort of engine of growth for the entire world. I'm less convinced that that's the case. But I also want to say we always see sort of China, India as a threat. I think they are a gigantic opportunity, but we need to be prepared for it. In Italy, uh, we need to realize there are a billion of Chinese and a billion of Indians who want to come and see Rome, Venice, and Florence. And we're not prepared for that. And it says, Venice, you, you can hardly walk by today with much fewer people. Imagine when you have that, that, that number of, of uh, people coming. We need to think in, in those terms. You need to see the, the huge opportunities we have because uh, we are lucky to some extent. Uh, uh, our country is, is beautiful and very attractive and has a lot of reputation. In fact, a lot of the, the um, fashion industries is capitalizing on that. So I think there are plenty of opportunities. We need to catch them uh, and see them. Uh, and I think there is nothing like the free market to do that. Luigi, I want to ask you one last question. What about crony academia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've spoken about crony capitalism, but um, in your book, you touch the issue of uh, business schools, um, that they, have, they can do a better job than you. Uh, as part of our community, I can do a better job at educating, better educating future business leaders, but also in your sector, um, as you know, and as you have also uh, pointed out in your book, there, there have been some economists accused uh, of taking money from big banks and big businesses um, in, to produce basically, I mean, they've taken money and as a result, they've produced favorable papers. So what's your view on this and what's the risk and how is academia trying to improve itself, both at the task of educating that better, um, better educating future business leader and, and improving itself? So the, the issue of sort of uh, money corrupting uh, academic research is not new and uh, I think it's sort of uh, very, uh, not very, it, People acknowledge it more in medicine because there's a longer track record. Uh, they acknowledge it less, so they're less aware of that in economics because until recently, no businessman was paying attention to us. We we're completely sort of irrelevant uh, uh, academics. Now we have somehow become more relevant, and so uh, we are also more influenced by money. And I think that uh, awareness is the number one step to try to ameliorate the problem, not decide to fix it. The second, I think, is, is greater transparency. Um, and, and maybe sort of uh, uh, making also more data available so that people can double check what others do. And this is, there is a, a, a counterbalance uh, in the academic uh, environment, which is the replicability of studies and the academic competition. I have an interest. If you are a big sort of person in an academia, you have a big result. I have a, a very strong interest in attacking your research and showing you wrong. Uh, that is the way you sort of balance that. Uh, but for example, 
one thing that I find it a, a source of concern is that ex expert opinions are most of the time sealed and sort of not really uh, available to this check. And again, I understand that there might be some reason to keep them sealed for a few years, but I would like after three, four, five years, you need a number of years as long as it's finite, uh, afterward it should be released so that we can check because there's a story that goes around my university that a law professor was coming out for tenure and somebody started reading one of those briefs that probably was published because uh, went to trial. And they started to challenge what he was doing there, how sort of good it was. And his answer was, oh, I hope you understood I was doing that for money. Uh, and that, that's sort of a, a big source of concern. So if we had, if I can, I think there is an academic integrity in the, that is maintained by sort of harsh competition, uh, and, uh, but we need to subject all our opinions to that academic integrity, uh, including the expert opinion. I think that that's, that's a big step. So on, the, on that front, I think we're making significant improvements, even maybe not, not enough, but significant improvements. Where I think we are more reluctant is to try to uh, weaving some social norms into our teaching, which I think that's what you're referring to, because uh, uh, that, that's a long conversation. I don't want to keep everybody until uh, 10 o'clock, but uh, you can read it in my book. But it, the, I think that uh, as economists, we tend to dismiss social norms, and I think it's a big, big, big mistake. Um, and we don't want to relegate them to ethic classes, because uh, you grew up in Italy, you remember religion classes. Uh, I think that uh, more sort of uh, atheists have been created by the mandatory religion class in Italy <laughs> than by Marx. Uh, so I think it's... Uh, the in, same. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I would recommend mandatory Marxist classes in school because that's a way to sort of... Uh, so, are you saying that <laughs> ethnic classes in business schools, schools have created more crony capitalists? <laughs> Absolutely, because they, they think about social responsibility. Most of them are about corporate social responsibility. And uh, I think we should first have individual social responsibility, and then we can talk about corporate social responsibility. But these classes are about corporate social responsibility to cover the lack of individual responsibility. So uh, look at the website of Massey Ferguson. We are about the environment. Yes, we kill workers in the mines, but forget about it. In we are top of the list in any measure of corporate social responsibility. So yes, I think that uh, uh, you have to deal with facts in the class you teach. You have to say a certain behavior in finance is bad, and we professors should stand up in this. We shouldn't delegate this to the ethic class to say this is bad. Good. Well, and with this, we close. I thank you very much, and thank you for staying, and, and uh, more than anything, coming uh, even though the rain. And I hope we can do it again.